This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manacero, and this is the show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dog, spelled D A W G. Find our podcast and subscribe. Well, we have a, a great uh, show for you today. Uh, I got a fellow podcaster here uh, with us. Uh, we're going to be speaking with Seth Ferguson, and he has more than a decade of experience in high performance real estate. As the president of Alba Capital Group, he partners with investors to acquire and improve multifamily properties and key growth markets. Seth speaks about various real estate topics and strategy and is the host of Purchase to Profits, where he interviews successful real estate investors. Seth also holds his real estate broker's license in the province of Ontario and was thrilled to publish his first real estate book, Sell for More, in 2018. Well, Seth, welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. Thanks very much, Bill. I'm really looking forward to this. You, you do a great job on your show, and uh, you definitely have a voice for radio. So. <laughs> <laughs> I got a face for radio, that's for sure. That, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Seth, this is great to, to connect again with you. Um, I was just recently on his show, and uh, so this is uh, going to be a kick. It's always fun to be on the on the receiving end of this now uh, he's going to get to kick back and i'm going to have to uh, you know c- come up with some great you know just uh, put them on the spot type questions right <laughs> yeah. I, I i'm ready for it give me the give me your best so. <laughs> give me your best shot well uh, seth you know this is going to be fun for me too because i you know i uh, love uh Canada. I've been up there a, a lot of times and uh, it's just a beautiful part of this uh, North American uh, uh, continent we're on here. I uh, just uh, love to hear also some of the unique uh, aspects of of uh, investing up there. I know you do re- re- invest uh, down here, I believe, too, but uh, you can tell us all about that. Why don't you just maybe just give me your, your story? You know, where'd you come from? How'd you get into real estate and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, for, for sure. So, I got into real estate it, mainly because of my father. Um, my father had uh, recently purchased a real estate uh, brokerage. Um, so I had been uh, living in uh, Minneapolis uh, doing hockey. I, I was a full-time hockey referee with aspirations of making it to the NHL. Um, wow. But many of the people I work with are now in the NHL. Um, I just didn't make the cut. So uh as I was still doing hockey, selling real estate on the residential uh, brokerage side gave me a good opportunity uh, to have a flexible schedule so I could still travel around, do the games, and uh, and make a living at the same time. So that's how I entered real estate on the brokerage side. Um, and then after 
uh, after a number of years, I've realized that it's the people who don't do the deals, like broker them, but it's the people who acquire the properties that truly build wealth over the long term. Um, and, and that really flicked a switch in my brain. So I, I started uh, learning more and more about um, about real estate investing. This was before YouTube was a big hit. Um, so and now with YouTube and shows like yours and, and mine, that the wealth of information out there is just overwhelming. There, there's so much good stuff. Um, and then uh, I guess that the rest is history. That's great. Well, I would be uh, curious to see. Now, you you started obviously uh, as a broker in in uh, Ontario, right? And uh, did you also start investing in the same area, or did you start going other places uh, right away? Or, or where? What about your investments? Where were they? Yeah. So, so my first investments were single family homes, um, and those were centered in and around. I, I live just outside of Toronto in a town uh, called Milton. And uh, my first investments were in Milton. Um, it, was an, it was a market I knew like the back of my hand. I grew up there. Um, I, I sold real estate there. So it just made sense for me at that time uh, to start acquiring property in the market I, I knew the best. Um, since then, my investing strategy has shifted over to multifamily. Um, but, uh, but for those first four properties, um, it, it was in and around my, my neighborhood. Well, tell me about that shift to multifamily. Why, why uh, not just keep buying single-family homes? Yeah, I, I think the the many single-family home investors run into a capital wall at some point where they want to grow their portfolio at, the, at a rate that their their access to capital it, it you know it doesn't keep up. Um, also, I, I found. The, the very successful investors that I was looking up to and taking advice from, they were able to use multifamily, um, that sort of asset, to scale their business in ways that are, isn't really possible with a single family portfolio. You know, I, on my show, I, I speak with people who have purchased 86 single family homes in one year. Um, so you can have that scale, but you've got 86 properties spread out all over the place. To me, it just seemed uh, like a better way to go where you can acquire 150 units in one single property. You've got your dedicated management team. Then you're, and plus there's also the financing side in Canada. Uh, lending is extremely tight right now. Um, it, it is, you know, they want an arm, two legs and your first, uh, first born child before they'll give you a mortgage <laughs> uh, for, for a single family home. And that's tough as a, you know, a self-employed person because you have to go through a couple extra hoops because uh, you don't have a W-2 or here in Canada, a, T, um, a, 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 a T-1 um, for your income. Um, so it was multifamily appealed to me for, for those reasons, mainly for the, the scale of it. I'm able to purchase those properties with investors, uh, leverage their funds, and, uh, and really drive a value-add system uh, to, to, to generate those uh, returns. Now, here in the, the lower 48, we have most banks don't allow you to have more than 10 mortgages. Do you have similar regulations up, yeah. up there? It's the same thing. Mm. And uh, it, it's, it just makes it quite challenging. Then you have to get into the partnership. So you have somebody else on title of the house and carrying the debt for you. It, I, like I said, there's many people who are incredibly successful at that single family um, you know, uh, niche or, or niche. Um, I, I just felt for me, with my goals of real estate, multifamily was a better vehicle to accomplish those goals. And um, tell me about the sort of the first foyer into the multifamily world. Yeah, so we are uh, right smack dab in the middle of the first foray. Uh, so I am actively uh, raising capital now uh, for uh, my first acquisition. Um, I, I think it's important whenever... Whenever you're trying to move into a new new territory, it's important to find a, a mentor or somebody who's been through uh, through that process before, so you can learn from them, uh, leverage their network, um, all all that kind of stuff. So I've partnered with some really great people who have done some amazing things in uh, in that multifamily space. So I'm uh, I'm riding not on their coattails, but I'm I'm drafting right behind them as if we're racing bicycles or uh, or NASCAR. Um, you know, taking any tips they have, uh, learning from what they've done before, and uh, hope hopefully improving on it uh, somewhat. 
Do you um, uh, have anything under contract at this time, or you're just basically uh, raising the funds and then and then we'll uh, look to acquire something at that point? Yeah. So right right now, I do not have a deal on contract. I want to have about uh, two to four million dollars uh, committed before I put a deal under contract. So right now, uh, like I said, I'm actively meeting uh, with uh, accredited investors and having those initial conversations about our strategy, our take. Um, and uh, what we see in terms of the markets we're looking at uh, in terms of how to, you know, drive that value and uh, really push those returns. Well, that's great. Now, you still have your uh, single family homes uh, still, right? Uh, yeah. So um, another, well, we can probably touch on this a little bit later on if you want to get into uh, the extreme challenges um, I'm facing right now. But uh, yes, I, I do have the uh, the single family homes. Uh, there's a personal situation in the works right now uh, that will probably wipe out uh, most of it, um, unfortunately. So it's, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> wow. You got my curiosity going here. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. And just, maybe just kind of taking a step back then, uh, looking more at sort of the fundraising side. Now, how in the world did you launch into that? And what has been sort of your most effective uh, way to attract investors? Yeah, I, I think for anybody, you have to leverage your network that you already have. Um, there, there's no point in doing cold calls to people. Um, cold calls, you know, if, if you know, we're, we're basically in a sales business, the, the money raising business is like sales. You know, you have your lead funnel and uh, it's always better to have a warm lead rather than a cold lead. And and you generate those warm leads from your network because, you know, whether it's your uncle knows somebody who's an accredited investor, that's a warm introduction. And your chances of closing are a lot higher uh, when you're walking in for that first initial meeting or having that conversation. There's less walls or barriers up uh, between you two. Um, so for myself, it was just a matter of letting everybody I knew in my network what I was now doing. Um, I think I was fortunate in that I built a very successful real estate uh, brokerage business for about 10 years. Uh, so, so I had a, a large number of people who knew me as a real estate expert. But now it, it was my job to let those people know that I'm now an expert in this other niche that maybe they hadn't been exposed to. So um, a lot of my work now has just been uh, telling people, sharing with them the differences between single family and multifamily, uh, sharing with them the advantages uh, of both and the and the differences, and uh, and really just getting the word out there. I, I think that there's so many people in life where they always dream of getting into real estate, but they never do. So so those are the type of people you're trying to reach out to. They, they know real estate's good. Uh, they've always wanted to do it, but they've never pulled the trigger. So they just need an experienced expert to help them. Um, maybe, you know, they, they would come in as a limited partner. They don't have any real estate experience, but they want to take advantage of the great things multifamily has to offer. Now, when you made that transition from, you know, broker to investor, um, were there certain challenges that you encountered, uh, you know, as you were seeking to acquire properties? Um, I I don't think so. It, the... I wouldn't say challenges. It's just you have to learn how to separate the the two businesses. You know, you can't on, on your broker side. It's all about you know customer service and all that. On the investment side, it's you have to just look at the numbers and look at the long term growth. And I, I think I, I'll say something that might be a little divisive here, but you know. Just because somebody's a real estate broker doesn't automatically mean that they're an expert in real estate investing. Uh, there, there's many real estate agents out there that I know who are amazing at the sales job, but they don't understand very much about the investing side of real estate. So I, I think it's important to make that uh, differentiation. Gotcha. And yeah. what what is the market like right now uh, up there in terms of, uh, you know, just as you've out there seeking good properties. I'm sure you're looking for properties that you can get at some sort of a discount, I would imagine, um, uh, yeah. you know, as far as a good investments are concerned. Yeah. Uh, w would you like me to speak on uh, the multifamily or the single family or both? Uh, both, actually. Yeah, I'd like okay. to hear on both. Yeah. So so with uh, here in, in the greater Toronto area, um, things have cooled off. We had the peak of the market in the spring of 2017. Um, last year, sales volume was at a very low level. Um, 
prices uh, had eased up. So I would say, depending on your submarket, uh, you could be in buyer market territory. Uh, so now's a now's a good time to uh, to be looking to acquire properties. I do have some clients still um, on the brokerage side that uh, we're actively looking and scouting for them uh, to get them into whether it's their first or second or third rental property. Um, on the multifamily side here in Canada, cap rates are extremely compressed. Um, you know, we have people buying places in Toronto at a two and a half cap, um, which uh, which is a different uh, ball game altogether. Sounds like um, so, Southern California. <laughs> oh, it's, 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 it's just crazy. Um, you know, we, we do have, you know, the, the key market drivers and the fundamentals, fundamentals are, are solid. You know, that just the, the sheer population growth and the in-migration, um, you, you know, for the next 20, 30, 40 years, uh, the Toronto area is just going to be one huge growth. Um, you know, there, there's, there's, you know, 200,000 people moving here a year. Um, so, so that's really fueling a lot of it. Uh, but for myself and, and Alba Capital Group, uh, which is my multifamily investment business, uh, we're looking in uh, markets such as Houston. Uh, I really like Houston, um, and so we're, we're building those relationships. Uh, you know, we're we're underwriting deals on a weekly basis right now. Uh, just to as soon as we have those funds, we're ready to pull the trigger and uh, and get something under contract. And what kind of criteria do you have for the properties, the multifamily properties you're looking for? Yeah, we're, we're certainly looking for anything over uh, 100 units. Um, I, I like the scale um, aspect of it. So we're, we're preferring in that, you know, 150 to 250 range. Um, I, I'm a big believer in the value add system. So ideally, we would be looking at something where it needs that lipstick uh, renovation, nothing too heavy. Um, but you know, just your your typical lipstick stuff. You know, kitchen refacings, uh, some floors, uh, paint, that sort of thing. And uh, we're also looking for uh, management uh, inefficiencies. So you know, we can go in there with uh, with my partners. Uh, you know, we we have the experience managing properties, so we can go in, uh, clean up the management side, uh, get those expenses down, and and really you know, push those rents as much as we're able to, and and have some value add. Uh, in terms of rents as well. Uh, what kind of challenges are you facing in trying to find the the right properties uh, in the Houston area? Well, you know, like, like most markets, multifamily right now is pretty heated. Um, the, there are, the great deals are few and far between. Uh, so right now we are leveraging our contacts with, uh, with brokers right now. Um, I, and this, this goes back to getting the right people on your team. You know, the, the, the guys I have working with me, they've been around for a long time. They know exactly what they're doing. So I'm able to leverage their experience uh, to get those introductions and contacts uh, with, with people that wouldn't, would probably not even pick up the phone for me if, if I didn't have those guys on my team. Um, but I, I think right now, and I, I get this message from a, a lot of the investors I speak with on my show, you, you can't be trigger happy and just do a deal just because you have to do a deal in the way the environment is right now in multifamily you have to be patient like you have to be aggressive in finding those deals but you have to be patient where you're not jumping the gun on a deal that might work you still have to have your solid underwriting and i've noticed that uh because some people send me their underwriting on deals all the time i've noticed that some people might be being a little bit too aggressive in how they're underwriting the deal right now and they're not taking they're not taking that conservative approach that they might have you know a, a couple of years ago. Sure. Well, you've been an investor for what ten years now, right? Um, and uh, so I just trying to, you know, as you look back, um, and uh, you know, maybe it's more recent too. Uh, what would you say maybe your biggest mistake was in that process? Um, I would say the biggest mistake was not speaking with the lawyer before adding an X uh, to title on uh, a whole bunch of properties. <laughs> really? <laughs> Tell me about that. <laughs> so so that this goes into the personal situation in which I find myself now. Um, so unfortunately, there's a messy separation where somebody uh, wiped out the bank accounts and, uh, and took a whole lot of money and stuff. Um, so I, I think... For myself, I've learned a very expensive lesson at a relatively young age about um, getting solid legal advice before getting into 
any sort of relationship that involves your real estate assets because you you know when you first enter in a relationship you don't think of the worst case scenario but uh, more and more these days that worst case scenario does happen so i think my advice would be to anybody getting involved in real estate with uh, whether it's a, a wife or girlfriend or even a partner uh, make sure you speak with somebody uh, a lawyer um, who's very familiar with those structures and uh, make sure that you're looked after in the event that something does go wrong now, uh, do you have uh, LLCs, your properties, uh, you know, as limited liability corporations, or is it different up in Canada? No, yeah. So um, there, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, we purchased all of our properties in our own name simply because it, it made a lot more sense uh, for us in terms of qualifying for those mortgages. Um, there would be a couple less hoops that we would have to jump through. Um, but it's, you know... The, the, the structure didn't really make make or break the situation. Um, it was just more the uh, the, the the stealing of uh, money. <laughs> wow. Oh, so, gee. So it, is, it is what it is. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, getting a good lawyer on your side before you actually set up your real estate uh, investing or real estate business, right? I would imagine. Huge. And, and most people, um, and you know, myself included, when, when you get into real estate investing or get into a relationship, you know, everything, you know, it's roses all over the place. Um, But, you know, as you know, because you've been around for for a while in the investing space, um, you know, real estate deals go south, um, you know, partnerships can turn sour. So you just have to know and and lay those things out ahead of time. uh, So so you don't get stuck. Well, sort of on the other side of the coin, then, what, what, what do you think you, you did right? What was uh, sort of your biggest success? Well, I, I think that the biggest success would be actually just doing it. Um, and and I, I know it sounds so cliche and everybody says you just have to take action, but it, it's so true. Um, you know, I, I know with the real estate sales side, um, I'd always have people approach me and say, hey, I really want to get into real estate. Can you show me how to do it? And two years later, those people haven't done anything. They're, they're stuck in that analysis paralysis, uh, analysis paralysis mentality where they're, they're too afraid to do something, but they're just, they're just treading water. Um, and that doesn't, you know, that doesn't do them any good because 10 years from now, they'll still be dreaming about real estate, but haven't done anything and have nothing to show for it. Um, I, and I think that one of the lessons I learned in terms of my successes was the power of leverage. Um, so, you know, by buying the right property, doing the right renovations, putting the right tenants in there, and then refinancing that and using the money that you took from the refi to now acquire another property. I think that's the most beautiful thing about real estate because now I own another property with none of my own, with none of my own cash in the deal. So my, my, work, my return on investment is infinite at that point because I, I just used all of the bank's money to uh, buy another place. That's yeah. great. Well, do you think there's certain uh, skills or or gifts that you uh, realized, wow, this worked really well with my real estate investing that you think, uh, you know, something that uh, that has been a a product uh, or at least uh, contributed to your success? Yeah, I I think the one thing I learned in on the brokerage side was uh, how how important having the right market data is Um, getting familiar with, you know, of vacancy rates, um, you know, supply, uh, you know, you know, sales volume, just, just where, where you are and using that data to make educated decisions. I, I find lots of investors, they'll just pick a market because they like the market and, but they don't know why they like the market. So I, I think understanding the, the key market drivers, what really fuels the real estate cycle and, that allowed me to move from that single family duplex investing to multifamily because I'm already familiar with the terms. I know the numbers. I know what to look for. So you're a bit of a research nerd then, huh? <laughs> you know, for, a, for sure, which but, is a good thing. Definitely. Yeah, it's a good thing, but you have to keep in mind that, you know, you can research all day long, but you still have to not use your gut, but you still have to do something about it. Like you're never going to have 100% of the data you need. That doesn't exist. You know, you're never going to be 100% fully confident in anything you do because there's always that gray area somewhere. Um, So I I think the research is very important because that's going to give you a good foundation. But you still have to use like your street smarts 
in, in when you're looking at properties. So, you know, market data might might not uh, tell you that, oh, well, this is a huge value add opportunity right in front of you. But when you look at the property, walk around the neighborhood, you know, you're going to start putting things together in your mind um, that sitting in front of a spreadsheet won't give you. Gotcha. Well, you know, our audience is uh, primarily those that are 50 years of age and older. Uh, Some folks are approaching retirement. Some of them are already in retirement. And so we have sort of a different situation, uh, whereas a young guy like you, you know, you've got, uh, you know, many years ahead. You can uh, plot things out, you know, over a 20, 30 year timeline and so forth. But uh, uh, generally the folks that, that, you know, that we're speaking to are folks that kind of have built up most of their wealth already and, uh, you know, or they're, they're already in it. They're already in retirement and they're, you know, looking for additional income basically in, in the form of cash flow. What uh, suggestions or advice would you have for that uh, group in terms of getting started and, and being effective still uh, in, in their situation? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think the, the first piece of advice I would give is that it's not too late. Um, I, I know some, some people I've spoken with, you know, they, they could be 60. They think, oh, I've missed the boat on real estate. That's, that's not true at all. Um, and even though I, I'm a young guy, I want to do some amazing things in real estate over the next five to 10 years, which is probably the horizon that many of your listeners are looking at. So it, so we both have the same goal, whether you're 50, 60, 70, or here I am at 32. Um, Cause I, I just want to compress those timelines. Like somebody would, you know, if they're about to retire, um, there's deals out there every day. And it's just a matter of finding those deals. And I, I would also say that when you're looking at deals, always have your end goal in mind. So, you know, if you're looking at retiring in a couple of years and want to live off that cash flow, look at the deals and look at the structure of how you build your portfolio that will let you accomplish that. Um, I, I find lots of people when they first get started in real estate investing, they don't have a plan and they just start acquiring properties, you know, willy nilly without a any sort of structure or any sort of plan work backwards. Say I want to live off of X amount of passive income um, in five years time, then work backwards and figure out what you have to do and what properties you have to acquire to make that happen. I I think, I think that would be uh, my best advice. Great. Thank you. Well, what about your, your current business? It sounds like you're definitely on a, you're definitely on a new trajectory here. And, uh, uh, what what's sort of your your goals for the you know short term and long term? Yeah, so uh, my uh, my short term goal is with Alba we will be having a our first deal under contract by July this year. Uh, that's our goal. So we're going to be acquiring our first hundred unit plus property um, with a capital raise of you know uh, probably about four million. Uh, that's our short term goal. Um, long-term goal, um, over the next 10 years, I want to have a billion dollars of real estate under, uh, uh, under management. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. great. Well, going, going for the gusto there. You, you have to go, <laughs> you have to go big. You can't go small. Yeah, you got that. Right. Well, we uh, are kind of zooming by here, and uh, one of the things that we do near the end of our interviews here is we call it our wrap-it-up session, where I ask you a series of quick questions, and you kind of share resources that have been valuable to you, and it's just another means to bring some good information that our our listeners can use uh, as they uh, look at real estate investing as a means to help them in the future. So if you are ready, we can go ahead and start to wrap it up. I'm ready. Okay, favorite real estate book? I would say The Millionaire Real Estate Investor by Gary Keller. Great, great book, yes. Uh, How about the favorite just general business book? Uh, That would have to be The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Yeah, also another excellent book. How about most valuable website for success uh, other than your own? Um, I would say Bigger Pockets is a good resource for people getting started. Yeah, good. Yeah. Another good one. How about uh, any favorite apps that you might use on your phone uh, that have been valuable for you? I, I would say the Google Calendar. <laughs> that, that keeps me organized. <laughs> That's yeah. great. That's great. Yeah. And how about a favorite quote? Uh, my favorite quote would be, if you think it's expensive to hire a professional, Wait until you hire an amateur. 
<laughs> that sounds like my my quote for contractors. And uh... <laughs> yeah, it, it's so true. It, like it, it proves itself true time and time again. Oh man, you got that right. And then this one here: if you basically lost everything you had and uh, built up over the years here, and all you were left with is one thousand dollars in cash. What would you do with that $1,000 to relaunch your real estate investing business? I think this question is extremely relevant because I am in that situation at the moment. Wow. Um, so how I would use that $1,000, I would use that to build a platform in which I could share my knowledge with other people, um, which is exactly what I'm doing on my show, Purchase to Profits. Um, I am sharing the knowledge and experiences I've uh, I've had over the past 10 years and sharing the experiences my guests have had and it's a giving mentality. You give first and so you're giving out free information, all sorts of good stuff and at some point down the road, that's all going to come back to you tenfold. That's great. Uh, have you ever heard of the book uh, Go-Giver? Um, that's a that's an excellent uh, uh, reference uh, along that same that same line of, of giving first and uh, and then letting everything uh, happen afterwards. So yeah, it's a that's a great uh, great approach. I like it. Yeah, I, I've never read that book, but I'll I'll make a note to uh, find that at the bookstore. Oh yeah, I think you'd enjoy it definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of folks listening here too that uh, would love to find out more about you and what you do. And uh, what would be the best way for our folks to to reach you or, or to find out about you? For sure. So I will direct them to two websites. So the first website is SethFerguson.org. Uh, you can find my you know my background, um, inf information about purchase to profits, all that sort of stuff. And uh, if you are an, incredit an accredited investor looking for some great real estate opportunities, you can also go to albacapitalgroup.com, Alba, A-L-B-A. -A. Uh, excellent. Well, uh, gosh, the time is kind of zipped by here, and uh, it's a shame because uh, a lot of, lot of good uh, information shared. And I appreciate that. But we have a tradition here, and uh, we always ask our guests to close us out with their best old hound dog howl. So, uh, you know, you're a Canadian guy. There's probably like a lot of wolves up there and stuff. That, uh... <laughs> yeah, I have, uh, I've got the polar bears beside my igloo. So, <laughs> yeah. so why don't you just go ahead and give me your, your best old hound dog howl. <laughs> All right. That was a good one. That'll work. All right. <laughs> well, Seth, thank you so much for being on. This has been really a blast and uh, I really appreciate your sharing, you know, some of the challenges too, as well as some of the successes. Uh, I know that uh, those are sometimes the, the toughest thing, but boy, we certainly learn from those. That's, I think, one of the big lessons uh, we have uh, in life is those mistakes that do happen uh, that we, uh, next time we make sure we don't repeat. <laughs> For sure. And, and you know what? I, I will just mention that most of the incredibly successful people I've interviewed on my show, they all had something really bad happen to them and they always came back far stronger. Yeah, well, that's the truth. If you look at even the world's uh, wealthiest men, you know, they've been through many a failure in their life, some multiple bankruptcies and other major disasters. But uh, it's that persistence and that drive to, to just keep uh, keep on moving forward and keep plugging on is, that really will get us where we ultimately want to go. So uh, I agree with you on that one. Absolutely. Well, uh, again, thanks, Seth. And I also want to thank all our old dog listeners out there, too, for joining us. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing right, uh, right now, but the fact that you've taken the time to join us means a lot, and we greatly appreciate it. Uh, please note, uh, everything presented here today, including some of the links that uh, Seth shared with us here, and uh, will be available in our detailed show notes on the Old Dogs website at olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog. And look for the episode with uh, Seth Ferguson. Well, that's the show for today. Remember, cash flow is king and real estate investing the means. Until next time, keep moving forward and may God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. 
We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.